or October. Um, nope, it would be September, <laughs> almost October, but September webinar for the um, Blue Trails Guide monthly webinar series. Um, my name is Faye Augustine, and I am the Intermountain West Blue Trails Manager. So I'd like to thank you guys for joining us um, this morning and afternoon for our presentation on protecting rivers through improved codes and ordinances. So per usual, if your connection is lost, um, I encourage you to log in again using your unique web link and passcode that was provided to you when you registered with GoToMeeting. And as always, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on October 5th for, blue, for viewing at bluetrailsguide.org slash blog. And then finally, um, attached is my, or below is my um, contact information, my email, um, as well as my name and title. So if you have any issues um, throughout the webinar, please feel free to send me an email and I um, will work to help you resolve them. But again, we will have um, the webinar recorded and available for viewing afterwards. The last piece, um, we encourage you to ask any and all questions throughout the webinar. Um, and in your GoToWebinar panel, you will see a side box that says questions, and you can feel free throughout the webinar to go ahead and type um, any questions you might have in this little question box, um, or you'll, you're welcome to save them until the end. Um, and we'll leave about five to 10 minutes at the end of the webinar, depending on time, to answer as many questions as we can. Um, and then after the webinar, we will have a um, list of all questions that were asked in our community forum at bluetrailsguide.org slash um, forum, as well as on our Blue Trails Guide, and those will also be up um, next Monday, October 5th. So with that, I would like to introduce um, my colleague, Stacy Williams, who is uh, an associate director with the Blue Trails program. Um, for American Rivers. She is based in our Des Moines, Iowa office um, and has been with American Rivers for almost seven years, working um, really closely uh, with a number of communities throughout the country on um, protecting rivers, uh, specifically working um, with a number of different communities on their codes and ordinances. So with that, Stacey, I will go ahead and pass it on over to you. Great. Thank you, Faye, and thanks to all of you for participating in, in this webinar. As I mentioned, my name is Stacey Williams. I am part of our Blue Trails team. Um, I've been with American Rivers going on seven years, the, the first five of which were spent heading up efforts on the Waccamaw River in coastal South Carolina, um, working with local partners to establish the Waccamaw River Blue Trail and protect that river using a variety of approaches. They've since relocated to Iowa and continue to work as part of the, the Blue Trails team. And as a program, we, we work, use water trails as a way to connect communities to their rivers, promote the variety of benefits they provide, including the economic potential of enhanced recreation, um, and develop strategies to protect them. We do this using a variety of tools, including land protection, restoration, water efficiency measures, and the method I'm here to talk about today, working with communities to improve their local codes and ordinances so that they better protect rivers. Um, the first kind of example or case study that I was going to highlight was actually the work of one of my colleagues pictured here, Matt Rice. Um, he, he worked on the Watery River Blue Trail, this is just when I was getting started, but it was, a, it was a huge success and really a great example of how community engagement and excitement about um, their local river and river recreation can spur changes to local regulations. Um, so mentioned as a result of the overwhelming success and support of the local community for the Watery River Blue Trail, um, this event that's pictured here was, was my first week on the job, or, or near my first week on the job at AR, and there was a launch event for the Watery Blue Trail um, in kind of this very rural area in central South Carolina, about 30 minutes outside of the capital city of Columbia. 
Um, so I showed up at this this remote access point, and there were well over 100 people there ready to paddle the new water trail um, and celebrate this, this recreational amenity in their community and the, the amount of excitement surrounding it was just um, something really exciting. There were masks, and um, it, was, it was just a really great event. And at that time, I saw the, the power of, kind of providing these opportunities for communities. So. Um, as a result, and building on that momentum, local partners and community, community leaders um, got the support of council and the larger community to pass a 100-foot buffer requirement on all rivers throughout this county and a 50-foot buffer requirement on all perennial streams within Kershaw County. I and mean, as I mentioned, it was a huge win, especially considering that was it, that it was in a, a conservative area and a very conservative state um, that really valued private property rights. But it highlighted the value um, the community placed on their water resources and and really just you know, the buzz surrounding the the development of this water trail and and, and rec starting to recognize it as a community asset and and a real key part of of the community. And then the second um, ordinance that I'm going to touch on was something that, that I actually worked on. This is a photo of the Waccamaw River in coastal South Carolina. Um, the Waccamaw River in Georgetown County, that's where this is, is located, it is, al is also considered the intercoastal waterway um, and during the lower reaches in Georgetown County. And as such, it's also monitored by the Coast Guard at the South Carolina DNR and Fish and Wildlife Service. And there are some questions and concerns over who had jurisdiction over the cutting of riverside trees. Um, so that kind of spurred, started to spur some discussion. And this area was also experiencing significant growth. Um, the county was in the process of updating their local tree ordinance. Um, so a group of our conservation partners um, saw the opportunity to work with planning staff to revise that, the tree ordinance in a way that did a better job of protecting the river and riverside trees. Um, a couple of key takeaways from that or those ordinance revisions. Um, one was that language was included in the newly revised tree ordinance that restricted the cutting of riverside trees. Um, <laughs> That had become a huge issue for people creating docks, and there were, that's where there were questions over jurisdictions. So this new ordinance um, limited the cutting of riverside trees. Um, and then another piece, and probably what I considered the most valuable piece that was included, um, was that the new the new new ordinance um, limited clear cutting of trees for quote unquote timber harvesting, and then putting in a subdivision for six years unless the developer replanted all of the protected types of trees to pre-harvest levels. Um, this was a huge win because um, what was often happening is that there were this is a, a timber harvesting area. Um, so developers were coming in and, and, and saying that they were timber harvesting and then the next thing you knew these huge thousands and thousands of acres would become subdivisions and there are no, um, there were no um, protections, and, and, and then all of the trees were clear cut. So this was a, a huge win. Um, and then the third piece of what we inc were, was, was included were um, was language that um, promoted non-structural solutions to stormwater management. So developers were required to retain. Um, trees of a certain canopy on site and of a certain, a certain species type um, to help manage stormwater using non-structural solutions. <laughs> and now I'm going to move a little bit upriver on the Waccamaw. Um, and so again, this is a coastal river near Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Um, the area is nearly, historically nearly about 40% wetland. Um, and this area where we're talking is currently predominantly rural, but that is changing rapidly. Much of the agricultural areas are being converted 
um, two subdivisions, the beach communities near Myrtle Beach are developed, um, and the focus for development is moving inland near the rivers. Um, so recognizing that it would be a losing battle to try and restrict all development, um, though we are working with local partners to protect a significant amount, amount of land through acquisitions and easements, but rather we, were, we wanted to come up with an alternative that addressed the flooding and ecological concerns posed by development along the river and streams. Um, so what we came up with was a conservation subdivision ordinance. And these photos that I've included um, were taking at, taken at two separate sites <laughs> along the river um, after a normal average winter rain event. The one on the left um, was, it was a site that they were trying to get um, permitted for development, and the um, photo on the right was an actual development, um, which, as you can see, was <laughs> was underwater. Um, so to get at this, a group of local stakeholders, including concerned Riverside landowners, um, that were now experiencing um, that were now experiencing flooding that hadn't previously met to met to discuss options to address these concerns. Um, we discussed a mandatory buffer requirement, um, but didn't have at that time the political will to pass a buffer ordinance. So again, we came back to um, this issue. This, we decided to address it through a change to the zoning regulations and add a conservation development district for new development along rivers and streams throughout the county. So there was much back and forth about mandatory versus voluntary um, and the chances of passage with each. Um, obviously, the conservation community wanted something mandatory. And on the other side, there was a lot of fear of pushback from, from developers. Um, so that was kind of a, a back and forth. We, it ended up that we included it as a voluntary ordinance, which I'll touch on again in a minute. Um, but the key pieces of this ordinance um, included a mandatory buffer requirement on adjacent rivers and streams. So we, there was a, a mandatory 100-foot buffer requirement on just straight off, off, the, off the bat. Um, there, were, there was language that included protection for all jurisdictional wetlands. There was no development in the 100-year floodplain. Um, and large old growth forest areas must be protected. So within that, what we did was look at um, protection of an additional protection of 40% of the buildable open space. And so that helped protect areas like um, Carolina Bays and encourage trails and green space in places that other, might otherwise not be protected. Um, so in addition to all those areas that would be protect, protected through other more traditional means like jurisdictional wetlands, there were also um, re requirements that protected 40% of the buildable open space. Um, and then in, in exchange, developers received a density bonus for including um, additional protections, low impact development, green infrastructure, um, and other environmentally friendly building options. Um, and then there were a list of qualifying components for these density bonuses. So what that means is, so for example, the, the density could not exceed one and a half times of the original zoning. So we didn't, there wasn't this kind of unlimited growth or unlimited density. density. Um, it, it was capped at one and a half times. And the push and pull there was coming up with something that would be, that would be seen as an incentive by developers to implement these conservation practices, but not something that then went too far and actually um, hindered what we were trying to get at in the first place. So that's for, at least for this example, was, was where we fell in the uh, one and a half um, extra above and beyond what, what the forest and ag 
um, zoning would would be in this in this area. And so this is I'm not going to go into a lot of number crunching specifics on this, but I wanted to to show it um, to show an actual approved subdivision request um, for this community. Um, the top left is forest and ag zoning for a specific parcel. This is an actual um, parcel along the Waccamaw River. Um, the top right is an approved rezoning request for that same parcel. Obviously, <laughs> you notice the, um, there's a significant amount of increased density. Um, and then the bottom rendering is that same development using the conservation subdivision design requirements that were proposed. Um, so the idea in agreeing to make this a voluntary option was that when developers came to the Planning Commission with a rezoning request for increased density, and that was happening more often than not, um, they could de deny the rezoning request but then suggest and encourage developers to use the conservation subdivision option, which got at the increased density that some, that some of the developers were seeking, but then also did a better job, a much better job of protecting um, the resource and protecting sensitive natural areas. Um, so I, I give this, <laughs> this example. Um, with kind of the, the precursor that the, the kicker in the end was that the ordinance was not approved by council. Um, and I won't go into kind of the political specifics of, of why that happened. But the positive thing that came out of it, out of um, is that while council was not supportive of a county wide ordinance, um, the momentum and buzz surrounding the Blue Trail on the Waccamaw led council to suggest a Waccamaw specific ordinance such as a floodplain overlay district. And then I also wanted to share this because I think that while it did not pass that go around, it is a good example of kind of trying to find some of that middle ground between development and natural resource protection. And then one other piece that I wanted to just very briefly touch on is um, we have been working with communities to protect rivers through revisions to have the hazard mitigation planning process. I'm going to only highlight two key pieces in this presentation because I've spent the entire time talking about this. But I um, just wanted to highlight two key pieces of, of things that we were, have been talking with in different communities about including. Um, one, we are working and we're working with staff in Ori County, again, and, and as well as other communities now, but to prioritize areas that after flooding events, um, the county will only pay to buy out properties within this repetitive loss areas. So, um, Rather than paying to redevelop the county within these um, repetitive loss areas and as part of the housing mitigation plan, would only pay to buy out um, properties that are, are continuously flooding. Um, this not only reduces the financial burden to taxpayers, but also adds long-term permanent protections to wetlands and floodplains along rivers and streams. Um, that will help reduce flooding impacts in the future. Um, and then the second piece that, that we've been working with communities to do to include are prioritizing targeted parcels within, again, these repetitive loss areas as priorities for protection, and then working with municipalities to go after and, how, and, and identify the potential targets for um, pre-disaster pre mitigation grants through, through FEMA, so getting out ahead of, of that, of, of the issue. Um, and now more recently, we are working with folks in the Upper Mississippi Basin to do some of these same things. We are working with the community in Iowa to develop their riverfront master plan 
um, which includes several recommendations such as a modification of two dams, conservation priorities, recreational amenities, and revi revisions to the municipality stormwater ordinance to include buffers and green infrastructure. Um, the key takeaway from this, I think, is that these recommendations were developed after a series of public input meetings where the community was asked what it valued about the resource. And then based on that community feedback, draft recommendations were, were developed because of the, the, the values of the community like on, on the river and its protection. Um, as I mentioned, this project is, is still in the development stages, so, so stay tuned for kind of an update on some of those. Um, another piece in the discussion and planning phase um, here in, the, in, in, in Iowa and in Upper Mississippi Basin is working, we're working with municipalities and several other local partners to think, start thinking about and just we're starting the discussion about the development of model ordinances um, for some of these larger metro areas so that with baseline criteria that, w that they would in theory then all adopt so that one community is not at an advantage over another for development because of more stringent regulatory requirements. So basically leveling the playing field. So several mayors and, and staff and local communities have said that this is something that they think is going to be necessary to get at passing some of these ordinances because um, they don't want to hinder development. So folks here locally are, are working as part of water trail and greenway planning. Um, and, and this would also then promote connectivity among those among those efforts. And then I just wanted to share with you um, some additional resources. Uh, this one is some of my colleagues at American Rivers created that I think does a really great job of breaking down some of this into manageable, understandable pieces. Um, the other piece is that it provides case studies, and I'm just going to kind of click through the drop-down menus for each of these sections and invite you to go and, and explore them. Um, more on your own, but the link is provided here as well. But if you you can also just Google American Rivers Green Infrastructure Training, and it will lead you right there. Um, but it, it provides a lot of really great resources, and then also several um, in several different case studies as well as other research, both from American Rivers and as well as as other um, folks. And then one of the last pieces I wanted to touch on, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this publication by the EPA. Um, it's a few years old at this point, but it does a good job of um, kind of piecing together the benefits and, and determining where communities are at in terms of, of planning and green infrastructure for improved water quality. And then also, what looks at what could be done to make them more water friendly. Um, and there is a link to this publication on the website that I suggested previously on the Green Infrastructure Training website. Um, and then this slide is just a piece from the scorecard, and I just showed it as a snippet of kind of what um, is included and how this publication ranks. Um, and quantify some of those benefits and then also offer suggestions. I just wanted to kind of show what, um, what that looks like. And in this, on the scoring rubric, they included um, protect, protection of natural resources and open space, um, promoting efficient, compact development patterns and infill, um, smart streets and overall imperviousness, efficient provisions of parking, and then green infrastructure stormwater management. And then before I open it up to questions, this is just kind of a, a snapshot of a few resources that some of my colleagues at American Rivers have helped develop. And there are um, downloadable versions of all of these on the green infrastructure training website.
Well, I may have just got through a, a couple of photos and a couple of them, but um, so I just wanted to thank you, and and I am, we're hopeful that in the near future, one of our colleagues can do kind of a 2.0 version with more case studies and examples from other parts of the country and kind of share their experiences with, with some of um, some of these working with codes and ordinances and, and working to improve them. So stay tuned for that. Um, and I guess thank you again for inviting me. And then I guess today we'll open it up for any questions that folks might have. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks again, Stacey, for that really awesome um, and, and interesting webinar talking about um, some of the great work that you've done and, and that others with American Rivers and our partners have done as well. Um, so as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, um, if you have questions, please feel free um, to put them into the question box now. I've got a couple here um, ready to go, but if there, um, if you guys have other questions or thoughts, um, would love to hear from you. And um, we've got about five minutes, so we have time for a few questions. And then as I mentioned earlier, all of the questions um, will be recorded and a transcript of the answers will be available on the Blue Trails Guide next Monday, October 5th. Um, so we will start, Stacey, um, with one question that was asked, which um, gets back sort of to the beginning of the process um, when you're starting to work on codes and ordinances. And um, the question was, who are some of the key partners um, that you work with when starting to um, engage local communities um, to change and alter codes and ordinances? And then are there key ways that you can work to engage people that um, might not be traditional supporters of some of the work um, that you're looking to do? Yeah, so in, in my experience and on the, the projects that, that we worked on and the, the area, especially in South Carolina where we were focused, it was experiencing, as I mentioned, tremendous growth. Um, and most of, a good share of that growth was in the housing market. Um, so we knew that it was going to be imperative if we are going to have any success to work with the real estate community as well as the development community. Um, so they were a part of the process from, from the very beginning. Um, we also had several landowners, the Riverside landowners, that participated as, as part of that process. Some that were concerned about development restrictions or future development restrictions on their land, but um, also they were seeing changes and in increased flooding and, and had some concerns associated with, with the growth and development. So um, I think those two groups for, for us were, were really key. And then obviously our local conservation partners uh, we had folks, uh, elected leaders in the county council uh, that were part of the process um, and represented the district surrounding the river. Um, so I think the, the wider you can cast that net and the more buy-in you can get um, initially from some of those audiences that may um, provide pushback or that you can kind of imagine would provide pushback from the beginning, um, the better. Um, because I think that if you get too far down the road and you haven't addressed some of those concerns, um, it's very likely that you won't get very far in, in the process. So that was, I think that was part of the delicate, that's part of the delicate balance is finding, you know, working with, um, Developers and there are several developers that are that, that were supportive and bought in and, and, and get what 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 this is what these these will do, um, but some of that's also then the fear of the unknown. So so I think that that if there's kind of a key takeaway that that's what it would would be. Great, thanks, Stacy. Um, the next question that um, that we have is um, someone was wondering if there is like kind of a list of best management practices um, that you know of or that others might know of, of um, when working on um, kind of buffers and four rivers and kind of other codes and ordinances, if there's sort of that like 
best management practices that, that folks use if there is something that's available for that, whether it's kind of by state or um, just has sort of been created. I don't know if, um, if you are aware of any of those resources, Stacey. Well, there are some best management practices, and there are some state-specific ones, but there are also, if, and if you want to, there a quick link on the green infrastructure training guide. If you go into the resource section, there's a best management practices for some of these, both from model ordinances. Um, so I can, if, if you want to shoot me an email, I can help guide you some of, some of those um, that might be of help when you're kind of looking at some of these things, there be buffers or um, stormwater stormwater ordinances or, or other land use regulations. Awesome. Thank you so much, Stacey. Um, but looking at the time, guys, it is 11.30, so I want to be sensitive to our half-hour webinar time. Um, so at this point, I will I'll take any other questions that you all might have and make sure that we answer them in our um, question recap that will be available on the Blue Trail Guide blog next Monday, October 5th. So stay tuned for that as well as um, the recorded webinar um, that will also be available um, next Monday with the set of questions. Um, so I mentioned this last month, but um, our survey is still open um, till tomorrow. Um, and we'd love to learn a little bit more about um, what your feedback is around our webinar series um, and how we can work to better um, tailor the series to your needs. So if you want to, um, I will send the link around to everybody again, um, and we would really appreciate your help in completing, again, super quick, short survey. Um, we want to make the webinar as helpful uh, for you as possible. So um, with that, thanks so much, guys. Appreciate you all joining us, and stay tuned um, for our webinar in October on October 27th. Have a delightful rest of your Tuesday, everybody, and we will see you all soon. Thanks so much.